sorry, it's not in person. Uh, I have been to Prince Edward Island on one occasion uh, prior to this, and uh, it was a weekend. I spoke in the Charlottetown Assembly, and uh, I distinctly remember, as, as well as the good fellowship in the Assembly, I distinctly remember having some wonderful fish and chips uh, during the weekend there, and also the foxes. That really stood out to me. I saw more foxes in broad daylight on <coughs> Prince Edward Island than I think I've ever seen anywhere else. So that was my outstanding memories of Charlottetown. But anyway, uh, glad that we can do it through this technology. And I trust the Lord will bless as we <coughs> look at the word of God. I'd like to ask you to turn, please, to Psalm 69. Psalm 69. And I'm going to read the first 21 verses. I'm going to be reading from the authorized version. I hope that you'll be able to follow along uh, with me. If you've got Bibles there, I'd like you to uh, follow along as much as possible. And so it begins uh, in verse one with these marvelous words, save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face, and become a stranger to my brethren, and an alien to my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me. I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire. Let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. And hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh to my soul. Redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Thou hast known my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. Mine adversaries, adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And again, God will bless indeed that reading from his precious word uh, to us uh, this afternoon. Well, this is what we know as a messianic psalm, and uh, it is a psalm written by David. Uh, we know that. Uh, it tells us in the subscription, a psalm of David, but that's even confirmed uh, by the New Testament, because in Romans chapter 11, uh, the Apostle Paul quotes from this very psalm, particularly towards the end of the psalm, and he says in Romans 11 verse 9, and David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them, which is a direct quotation from Psalm 69 verse 22, and it tells us David said it. Now, why do we even have to say that if it's so obvious? Uh, because liberal scholars, uh, people that hate the supernatural and hate the word of God, have a hard time seeing that David wrote this. They say that it doesn't refer to David's experience, and how could this be David? 
And of course, the answer is simple, that David, as he was moved by the Holy Spirit, was speaking about his greater descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ, that it is indeed one of those beautiful Psalms of the Messiah. And it is amazing to be reminded uh, today of the fact that a thousand years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, that you could reconstruct basically, basically his birth, his life, his death, his burial and resurrection entirely from the Old Testament scriptures and often from these messianic Psalms written a thousand years before he was even born. And such is our confidence in the word of God that this is indeed the inspired infallible word of God. And of course, uh, our brother John this morning was talking about encouragement. And he was, in, he was talking about encouragement when we meet together to seek to encourage one another, which I think is a great thing. But what if you're on your own and uh, you don't have anybody to share with? Well, and of course, many of us, I suppose, in the last year have experienced isolation, loneliness, maybe more than before. Uh, that's why we're so thankful for Zoom, by the way, because it does give us a connection with people, with saints. But nevertheless, uh, in isolation, uh, there was a time when David was uh, pretty much on his own. His, uh, uh, and it tells us uh, that David encouraged himself in the Lord. So when there's nobody else to encourage us, we can always encourage ourselves in the Lord. And I find there's nothing more encouraging to my heart than meditating on what the Lord did for a wretch like me on Calvary's cross and meditating on the portions of scripture that speak of his sufferings on Calvary. And you can't look at that and meditate upon that. And as it were, gaze upon him there, uh, hanging suspended between heaven and earth on that cross without sensing some encouragement to your soul. He loved me that much. He would do that for someone like me. And so I'm hoping that today we'll be greatly encouraged by this messianic psalm that magnifies Christ, that takes us to Calvary. And the fact that we know for sure it's messianic is that it's quoted seven times in the New Testament and directly related to Christ or to the consequences of his rejection. So it's definitely clearly messianic, seven ref references in the New Testament. And after Psalm 110, which Lord willing we'll look at later on today, and Psalm 22, uh, which I had the privilege of preaching on at seven o'clock this morning to the Christians in Malaysia, uh, those two other Psalms are mentioned, are referred to in the New Testament more than Psalm 69, but Psalm 69 comes third in the table of prolific references in the New Testament. And so very important Psalm. And it's a Psalm where the key uh, verse is verse four, where we read at the end of it, of course, verse four, they hate me without a cause at the beginning. Uh, that's quoted in the New Testament. We'll think about that in a moment. But the phrase I wanna think about is, the very last phrase, then I restored that which I took not away. And this psalm has been called the psalm of the trespass offering. And the idea of the trespass offering, it was one of the Levitical offerings. And if you know anything about the Levitical offerings, you know that these Old Testament sacrifices, every one of them had something to say about the person and the work of Christ. That's why many of them brought a beautiful aroma into the presence of God. It's not that he had a particular fondness for barbecued meat, but the, the reason the beautiful aroma ascended into his presence was that it was a reminder to him of his son and what he would do in his life and his death on the cross. And so if you just turn with me for a moment to Leviticus chapter five, where we look just briefly at the trespass offering. We won't take a lot of time doing this. I wanna just look at a couple of verses in, in chapter five. In fact, if we had more time, you could look at the entire chapter five and into chapter six, verse seven, deals with the trespass offering. But for our purposes, uh, we'll break in in verse 15. It says, if a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, 
Then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flocks with thy estimation by shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. And he shall make amends for the harm that he hath done in the holy thing and shall add the fifth part thereunto and give it to the priest and the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. And so somebody who's done something and uh, they're guilty of it, they're to bring back what they had taken plus an additional fifth part to show that sin is costly, uh, that it really is costly to both man and to God. And so he had to bring back more uh, and a fifth part more uh, additional, uh, an extra 20%, so to speak, on top of whatever he had to be restored. And the thought here is that the Lord Jesus, who didn't ever sin, lived a perfect life. He, in his work on the cross, restored to God that which was lost through Adam's sin and some and more, in a sense. He, he paid back uh, that which he did not take away, but even more than that, an additional part. He restored which, that which was lost through man's sin, but added more. And the idea is that God received more glory through the finished work of Christ than if sin had never entered. That somehow this work so glorified God uh, through sin, man, uh, God lost a, a creature. Uh, he lost uh, the, the creature Adam that he had made in his image and likeness. But through the work of Christ, he doesn't just get creatures back, but he gets sons. Many sons are going to be brought to glory as a result of the work of the Lord Jesus. And so uh, through grace, more is restored than that which is lost. So that's the idea behind uh, this trespass offering. And so we'll, we'll think about that as we go through this psalm. But before we do, we want to think about the title at the beginning of the psalm. First of all, it's addressed to the chief musician, as many of the psalms were. And because we recognize these psalms were songs, they were hymns that were to be sung in the worship of the nation. And so they were, they were often the, the lyrics were written uh, here by David as he's moved by the Holy Spirit, sent to the chief musician. And the chief musician then was to compose a, an appropriate tune from which this psalm was to be sung. And so it was sent to the chief musician, uh, Asaph would have been one of those chief uh, musicians. Heman would have been another one. And uh, ultimately, uh, by the way, according to Psalm 22, the real chief musician uh, is none other than the Lord Jesus. I want you just to look back there with me for just one second, because Christ in resurrection is the one who really brings worship and praise uh, from his people to the Lord. And so verse 22, it says, I'll declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that, ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. And so the picture is a risen glorified Christ in the midst of his people, as it were, pulling from his people praise to God. He's really the chief musician. But again, back to our psalm, to the chief musician. And then it says, upon Shoshanim. This is this title at the beginning of the psalm. Now that phrase, Shoshanim, it simply means lilies. Some think that it could have been some kind of lily-shaped musical instrument. You know, like a bit like a trumpet kind of idea that had to be used in this. Uh, but uh, basically it means lilies. And when we think about lilies, uh, they often grow in the mire, uh, they often grow in the mud, they often grow amongst thorns. In fact, the writer Solomon, in his Song of Songs, uh, talks about that very thing, about lilies amongst thorns. And we see it in uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 2, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. And so uh, this idea of a lily growing up amongst thorns, growing up amongst miry muck and clay, amongst the mud. 
and it would speak to us, uh, Lily, uh, of the purity, uh, the loveliness of our Lord Jesus, of his glory. Uh, for instance, uh, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these, like one of what? Consider the lilies of the field, you see. And so there's something beautiful. In fact, we were, my wife and I were in our local supermarket the other day, and they were selling Easter lilies, and they looked absolutely beautiful. We managed to resist the temptation to buy one, uh, but they did look rather splendid. And so it's a picture of the Lord Jesus, I believe, uh, the one uh, amongst the thorns of sinful humanity. Here is this one who is lovely, who is pure, who is tender, who is glorious uh, amongst the thorns growing up in the mud and the muck of a fallen world. Here is this lovely one, the Lord Jesus. And so we said it's this Psalm of David and of course connected with springtime, connect, connected with Easter, connected with Passover uh, are the lilies. In fact, it's very interesting that in Ireland, we, my wife and I were missionaries there uh, for, for eight years. And Easter was very famous for the Easter lilies. People would often have them pinned upon their lapel and they would go around with an Easter lily. So it definitely connected with uh, this time of year with Easter, springtime, Passover. And so just to give you an outline of this Psalm before we dive into it. So the first 12 verses is going to speak about the rejected one. And we're gonna read, read a, a, a lot about his rejection about his suffering the various spheres of his rejection and then in verse 13 through 18 we're going to look at his refuge uh, what did he do uh, when he was so rejected by so many well notice 13 verse 1 but as for me my prayer is unto thee and so the refuge of this lovely one was prayer to to go to his father in prayer and then from verses 19 through 21, we're going to look at the reproach of the cross, uh, the, the reproach connected with him hanging suspended there, naked on that cross and all that he endured while he was there. And so 19 through 21, the reproach of the cross. And then from verse 22 through 28, the recompense for the rejectors. What, what will happen to this nation that rejected him? Remember, he came to his own. His own received him not. And we have uh, the description of the consequences for the nation of Israel uh, because they rejected him in verses 22 through 28. And then it finally ends, uh, like Psalm 22, with a song. And in verse 29 through 36, there's the refrain of the remnant. And there's praise, it kind of saturates the end of this psalm. Look at 32, the humble shall see this and be glad, and your heart shall live that seek God. It's going to be great praise as a result of the work that this one has done upon the cross. And so as we consider the rejected one together uh, this afternoon in verses 1 through 12, in verse 1 and 2, we begin to enter into the sorrows of the Son of God. And some have suggested, and I like the suggestion, that if the Gospels give you the facts of the crucifixion, and they do, the Psalms enter into the feelings of the crucified one. What did it, what did it feel like for the Son of God to bear our sin? What did it feel like for him to be there in agony on the cross. And we get a little glimpse into the feelings of the crucified one. And so let me just read again verses one and two and consider them together. Let God arise. I'm reading six, Psalm 68, that makes sense. Uh, 69, save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there's no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods over flow me. And so you get this incredible description. Here's somebody, and it, it, it's, you talk about a sinking feeling. He, he's in the mud, and he can't get a footing. The, the mud is just, he's just sinking into the mud. There's no place to, to get a solid footing. And at the same time, the water is rising and, and uh, just coming higher and higher and 
and higher. And it's just this, this awful feeling of drowning uh, under uh, this uh, experience, being o- overwhelmed, a uh, feeling of hopelessness uh, as, as the water rises, as he can't get a grip on his feet. And so what is going on here? What is he speaking of? I think Psalm 42 verse 7 might give us a little bit of a glimpse of what really is happening here. Just turn there, please, for a second. Psalm 42, verse 7. It says this, Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. Then it says this, All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. And so the idea is this, that as he's there on Calvary's cross, the one who knew no sin, being made to be sin for us, and as the waves and billows of divine judgment are pouring on his holy soul. And it just seems he's drowning under the the weight of the, the, the waves and billows of God's judgment pouring out upon his holy soul. Uh, desperate to get a foothold. The water's rising. The waves and billows are, are pouring out. And at Calvary, the Lord Jesus endured the mighty ocean of judgment. God, as it were, gathered all the waters together in one place and poured out his righteous indignation and, uh, against sin, against his son, the Lord Jesus. And so here he is, that sinking feeling. And yet, please, I want you to turn with me to another psalm, Psalm 40. I want us to look at verses 2 and 3. Because we often say, this is our experience. He says, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. And the picture is simply this, that we were sinking. We often sing, I was sinking deep in sin, sinking to rise no more. Remember, we, we were in that position. And yet the Lord took us out of the miry clay. He put our feet upon a rock. He put a new song in our mouths, even praise to our God. And yet, what, at what cost? The Lord Jesus had to endure the waves and billows of divine judgment against himself so that we might stand today on that solid rock, uh, saved, redeemed, a new song in our hearts because of the work of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. In verse 3, it says, I am weary with my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. The reason why we know it's not just literal water that he's dealing with, with feeling of being drowned, is because if, you, if there's water everywhere, you're not thirsty, but this is the judgment of God. And we remember on the cross, he cries out, uh, I thirst. Uh, and he was uh, enduring, as it were, the, the heat of divine judgment. And it says he cries out and is hoarse from doing so. His cry, save me, O God, uh, seemed as if he'd been crying for an eternity. Weary of my crying, my throat is dried, mine eyes fail while I wait. For my God. And of course, the heavens were as brass. Uh, There was no answer. He had to endure that cross. He had to despise the shame. He had to go through it all. And there was none to answer. Uh, There was silence because God, the Holy One, could not look upon iniquity as the Lord Jesus was there being made to be sinned for us. And then we begin to get a glimpse into the extent of his rejection. Not only did he experience that rejection when he was made to be sin, as in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But there was rejection from the nation. We see it in verse 4. It says, "They, they that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. And they that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. And I restored that which I took not away. Look, please, at John 15, John 15, verse 25. The Lord Jesus in his upper room discourse quotes again directly from this psalm and this particular scripture. And he says in verse 
25 of John 15. But this cometh to pass that the, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. Where is it written in their law? Well, Psalm 69. They hated me without a cause. They hated me. And of course, we should not expect to be treated any different than our master. And there is rejection that comes from following him. And so we find that although there was no reason why they should hate him, right? They hated me without a cause. Because when we look at what he did, the Lord Jesus went about doing good everywhere he went. He alleviated suffering. He, he brought masterful teaching that brought joy to people's hearts. Uh, he went about doing good, yet this was the response of the nation. He came to his own, his own received him not. They hated him without a cause. But there was a divine purpose in all this. He restored that which he took not away. The Lord Jesus did not take away our innocence through the fall. He didn't take away our fellowship with God. He didn't take away the dominion that had been committed to man before the fall. However, his great work of redemption is about reconciling, res restoring that which was lost in Adam is being restored by the work of the Savior. Man by his sin has robbed both God and his neighbor. He's robbed God of his glory. And the Lord Jesus is going to restore that through the cross. He's robbed man of his happiness and his joy. And the Lord Jesus is going to restore uh, both honor to God and happiness to man through his great work on Calvary. And so it says in verse 5, now, some of the Messianic Psalms are all Christ. This afternoon, we look at Psalm 110. There's, no, there's nothing of David in it. In Psalm 22, it's hard to find anything of David. It's, it's all Christ. It's all his suffering. But in Psalm 69, there's something of David here, and that's verse 5. He says, O God, though thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. This could never refer to the impeccable Son of God, the Lord Jesus. So this is David's experience. And so we're kind of coming back and forth between David and the experience of the Lord Jesus. Uh, certainly, David did some foolish things uh, with Bathsheba. That was a foolish thing he did. Uh, calling for a census of the nation. That was a foolish thing. His sins were not hidden uh, from God. Uh, he tried to cover them up, but they weren't hidden from God. But this certainly could not be said of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, it says, Let not them wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Of course, David's prayer was that he didn't want anybody to stumble because of his failings. But now uh, we come back to the Savior and the reproaches that he experienced. I want you to notice that six times in this psalm, the word, the word reproach is mentioned. Kind of a major theme. Uh, it says it here in verse 7. For thy sake I have borne reproach. Verse 9. Zeal for thy house has eaten me up. And the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Verse 10. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. Verse 19. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Verse 20. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And so great, great theme is that of reproach, the reproaches that the Lord Jesus had to endure. And of course, that word reproach, it's the idea of uh, slander, mockery, scorn, contempt. Uh, it, it, that's how he's viewed. Uh, there, there's just a, a scorn, a mockery, a contempt of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and of course, uh, he is getting that reproach from every quarter, from every side. And so he begins to talk about it. I've borne reproach, shame has covered my face. So where did it come from? Well, look at verse eight, even in his own family, 
He says, I'm become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. And so in his own family, his upbringing, and again, scripture is so, so careful. Notice he says, to my mother's children, because uh, he couldn't say my father's children because his step brothers and sisters that are listed for us in the word of God, they had the same mother. They all had the same mother, but different father. His father was his father in heaven wasn't Joseph, but their father uh, was Joseph. And so he, he is very accurate the way that scripture uh, speaks about these things. And so he says, I become a stranger to my brethren and alien to my mother's children. So there was reproach, there was rejection, even in his own home. Uh, look, please, at John 7, John chapter 7, and we'll observe in verses 3 through 5, that prior to his resurrection his brothers didn't believe in him it says his brethren verse 3 of john 7 therefore said unto him depart hence go into judea that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest for there's no man that doeth anything in secret and he himself seeketh to be known openly thou do these things show thyself to the world then it says this very very telling statement for neither did his brethren believe in him and I, I just can't begin to imagine really what it must have been like for the lord jesus in that home that he grew up in in nazareth first of all we know that he was perfect he's the spotless sin sunless, sinless son of god and no doubt his perfections would have exposed their imperfections the contrast between a perfect son and these other brethren would have been quite stark. And no doubt it brought with it taunts of goody-goody, uh, hatred, disdain. You see that, for instance, even in uh, Joseph, a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus, but how his brethren hated him. And we see it, the very same thing in the Lord Jesus. By the way, I suppose it's good for us to remember this, that when it comes to those of us that have been saved out of religious families where there was some rejection, and some of us have known that, we've known the rejection of our families, uh, and, and it's, a, it's an awful thing. No, I wouldn't want anybody to go through it. But one thing about it is this. You can never say, well, it's okay for you, Lord. You don't know what it's like. You couldn't say that because the Lord says, I actually do know what it's like. That's why I'm a sympathetic high priest because I know exactly what it is to be rejected in my own family, to bear reproach in my own home. And so he says, I'm become a stranger to my brethren, an alien to my mother's children. And then rejection, not only in his family, but rejection in the temple. It says in verse 9, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. And one of the things that characterized the Lord Jesus, and this is very important, was a zeal for the house of God. It's good to have a zeal for the house of God. I meet a lot of Christians today who you ask them if they're saved. Yes, they're saved. Uh, they can tell you their testimony, and they read their Bibles, but they don't have a zeal for the house of God. They, they're indifferent. Uh, they're not in fellowship anywhere. They, they, they kind of, I guess they get their fellowship from, uh, from YouTube or something like that, and they're, 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 they don't have a zeal for the house of God. And I want to tell you something. Uh, you can't be like Christ and be indifferent to the house of God. You see, God's plan for your life, and I don't care who you are, if you're a believer, God's plan for your life is this, that you be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what God wants for you, right? He's predestinated to us to be conformed to the image of his son. And if you're indifferent about the church, you might be like Christ in lots of other areas, but you are not Christ-like if you're indifferent to the church of God. And so he had a zeal for the house of God. And of course, we see people like that in our Bibles, don't you? That Nehemiah in the Old Testament, 
He had a zeal for the house of God. It bothered him, the state of the testimony, that it was in ruins, and he wanted to rebuild it. You see the Apostle Paul, if ever there was a man who had a zeal for the house of God, it was Paul, the great apostle. He loved the truth. Uh, his ministry was uh, twofold. It was the grace of God and the mystery, which is the church, one body. And he, he never uh, varied in that. The, the gospel and, and the mystery of the church was, was his primary ministry. He was passionate about the house of God. And oh, I hope that COVID and Zoom, uh, that when you get back and when you get free again, that you will exhibit a tremendous zeal for the house of God, that, that you just will be chomping at the bit to get back to the house of God and to serve him like he's worthy of being served in the context of his house. But the Lord Jesus, it was his zeal for the house of God that showed up the religious hierarchy for what they were. They had turned the house of God, as we find in the New Testament, of course, this is quoted in John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 17, when the Lord cleansed the temple, and he said, you have made my father's house into a den of thieves, and he cleansed the temple. And so uh, the, his zeal exposed their wrong view of the house of God. To them, it was a, a, a merchandising operation, it was money-making scheme. And, uh, and so uh, his zeal exposed their falsehood. And of course, uh, if the more zeal we have for the house of God, we may make some enemies. People may misunderstand us. They may, uh, because it might show them up and their coolness to the things of God. And so not only does he have this rejection uh, in uh, the temple, uh, he also experienced rejection in every level of society. Notice, please, We'll read verse 10 and 11. It says, and when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. So in society as a whole, his rejection covered every gamut of society. When he talks about those that sit in the gate, that we know from scripture that that's where the judges met, the magistrates. Uh, remember when Boaz wanted to settle the matter with Ruth? Well, he went to the gate of the city, and that's where uh, business transactions and, and uh, legal issues were dealt with. And, and uh, Lot, uh, he sat in the gate of Sodom. It was, he was a magistrate. He, he had authority. Uh, Absalom, when he wanted to steal the hearts of the people, uh, he set up at the gate and he judged people's problems. And so it's, it's the, the place where the judges, where the magistrates, where the high officials would sit. And so we find that the Lord Jesus, those that sat in the gate speak against me. The, the high officials of society, Psalm 22 would call them the bulls of Bashan, the religious leaders. Uh, they spoke ill of the Lord Jesus. They hated him. And that would be true in our society today, wouldn't it? You go to the halls of academia. Uh, you go to the government. Uh, it's, and and it's, it's very common to speak ill of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and yet, not only is it at the higher echelons of society, those that sit in the gate, but also, you might say, in the lower echelons of society too. I was the song of the drunkards. The drunks in the taverns were also singing about him, but it wasn't singing the songs of Zion. Uh, it's songs of mockery and reproach. And so the idea is that the Lord Jesus was disdained at every level of society. And his name is still a curse word today. I think one of the hardest things about living and serving the Lord in Ireland was hearing the name of the Lord Jesus used so frequently as a curse word. It was just a common thing. And uh, it, this is society. They disdain the name of the Lord Jesus. His name is still used in that way to this day. And so reproach at every rev level of society. His own home in the temple, in every strata of society, rejection. 
And so what does he do? Well, his refuge is prayer. He says, but as for me, my prayer is unto thee. And as you look at the life of the Lord Jesus, he's often found in the place of prayer. Great while before day, he's speaking, communing with his father, sometimes praying through the entire night. Uh, you find him in Gethsemane as he approaches the cross. Uh, prayer was his great refuge. Uh, he found that to be a place of great comfort. Well, our time is going. I want us to think about the reproach of the cross. Look at verse 19. Thou hast known my reproach, my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I look for some to take pity, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. The reproach of the cross broke his heart. He looked for some to take pity, but he found none. All his disciples, we read, forsook him and fled. There's no one to comfort. Uh, you see the indifference of those that pass by. Uh, Lamentations 1, 12, and 13. Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Is there any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which the Lord has done unto me when he visited me in his fierce anger? And all around, there's this lack of comfort. Uh, here he is suffering in shame, in agony, and the reproach of it all, hanging there, uh, naked, suspended between heaven and earth, as uh, the gazing stock of those that mock and those that hate and those that are indifferent towards him. And notice that it tells us that in his condition, they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. This is never mentioned concerning David, uh, but it is mentioned in the New Testament concerning the Lord Jesus. Look at Matthew's Gospel, please, chapter 27, and verse 34, as we consider the cross, it says, they gave him vinegar, to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And of course, what is this that they were trying to give to him to drink? What, what exactly was this gall and vinegar that were mixed? Well, gall was a bitter tasting uh, uh, element that was put in. It was either made of wormwood or myrrh, and it was designed to dull the senses. And it was, it was kind of like a, a drug that would kind of help them uh, as they were suffering on the cross. But the Lord Jesus, he tasted it, but he wouldn't drink it. Once he knew what was in that, he wouldn't allow it uh, to be swallowed by him. He just tasted it on his lips because he wanted, as it were, to bear the full payment for our sin consciously when he hung on that cross not in some drugged stupor, but in full, uh, clear consciousness. Uh, look at John's Gospel, chapter 19. Again, we see the same thoughts brought before us. John 19, and we'll read from verse 28. It says, After this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. And there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar. He said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And so as we finish these sufferings for Christ, I want to just quickly look at the recompense for those that rejected him. When it says in verse 22, let their table become a snare before them, that they which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. We've already mentioned that this is quoted in the book of Romans and chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. And the point is that there are consequences for rejecting the Savior of the world. There are consequences for this nation. Uh, it, was, it became a snare to them. The nation has suffered tremendously because they didn't realize the day of their visitation. They rejected the one that came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And they said, we will not have this man to reign over us. And because of that, 
uh, they've suffered tremendously. Their eyes are darkened. There's a blindness in part that's happened to Israel. Uh, they, they, they see not. They make their loins continually to shake. They've, they've gone through tremendous terrors. And uh, all of these things because, verse 26, they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. And they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. And so as a result of that, of course, this is also quoted in Acts 1 verse 20 uh, concerning Judas. But it ends in a song. It ends in praise. I will praise, verse 30, the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. And so as we kind of just wrap up because our time has gone, I want to just say two things that uh, might be a very practical application to all of us that the Lord Jesus suffered tremendous reproach when he suffered in our place on Calvary's cross. And yet it's amazing how we don't even like somebody slamming a door in our face. We don't seem to like any kind of rejection for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And there's something wrong with that. I want to just to turn with you, please, to Acts 5 for a moment. Acts 5. In verse 41, Acts chapter 5, verse 41. Sorry, yes, verse 41. <clears throat> Let's read verse 40. It says, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And it says this, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Isn't it amazing? To them, to suffer reproach for the name of Christ was a badge of honor. They, they, they just thought it was amazing that they were counted worthy to suffer reproach for his name's sake. And then we think of the Apostle Paul. We love this great prayer, don't we, in Philippians 3.10, that I might know him. Don't we all love that? And the power of his resurrection, does that appeal to us? Do you, would you like the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus in your life? Of course you would. But then he says this, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, there's aspects of the sufferings of Christ we can't enter into. He had to bear them alone. His substitutionary, vicarious sufferings for sin, he had to bear them alone. But reproach and rejection, because we have zeal for the house of God, because we have zeal for him, then we should be willing and anxious to bear that reproach. And in days where increasing hostility is coming towards the gospel, how we need to think about Calvary in a fresh light. And like the early church, see it as a badge of honor that we might somehow share in the sufferings of Christ, the reproach and rejection. And if people slam a door in your face, it's not you that they hate. It's your savior that they hate. It's really not personal. If you came to their house on any other business, they'd be happy to see you. But when you're there on his business, there's that rejection. And we should be willing for that because of what our Lord Jesus endured for us. And if there's ever something that would encourage us, it's to think about this. He loved you so much that he endured the cross, despising the shame. Such was his love for you. Oh, what amazing love. Help me understand it. Help, it, help me to take it in what it meant for thee, the Holy One to bear away my sin. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for the word of God and for the, the privilege we've had today to, as it were, just stand and witness Calvary afresh. Witness that picture of one overwhelmed as the judgment of God is poured out upon him, like somebody drowning, trying to get a foothold trying so desperately as the waters are rising. And yet, Father, how we're thankful that we can say today that he took me out of the miry clay and he set my feet upon a rock. 
And he put a new song in my heart, even praise to our God. Oh, how we thank thee for the Lord Jesus in his own worthy, precious name. Amen.